if you want to be the best, work for the best. This is the Safari. The Safari is a tour around the consumer, brand, and retailing industry. And we have the great privilege here at my company, Traub, to really be exposed to many of the great minds of the industry who are forming and shaping the future of many different parts of the consumer brand and retail world. And I felt it was quite interesting for us to be able to not only learn from all of those people as we do every day, but uh, memorialize it into a podcast which could then be shared with many of our friends and clients and, and you, obviously, the listener. Hi, welcome back to the Safari Podcast. Today, I'm thrilled to welcome Todd Snyder, president, founder, and visionary behind the eponymous brand, Todd Snyder. Todd's journey is a testament to the power of storytelling and building lasting personal connections. His talent, vision, and love for fashion have woven together to create a successful and continuously growing brand celebrated for its accessibility and style. It was an absolute pleasure to speak with Todd, and I hope you enjoy. Hi, well, today I'm so thrilled to be joined by Todd Snyder, who's the founder and president of the very well-known menswear brand, Todd Snyder. So, hi, Todd. Welcome to the Safari. Hey, how are you? It's, it's great to be here. Well, we're thrilled to have you. And here we are at the very dog days of summer. Um, and I know you're not resting on your laurels in the dog days of summer because you have a lot coming up this fall and a lot going on. So thank you in advance for your time. I really, really appreciate it. My pleasure. It's an honor to be here and I can't wait to to chat with you. Well, all things Todd Snyder and I, again, am honored to have you. And you are, you are a storyteller through your brand, through your collections, everything you have done. And I can't wait for our listeners to hear your story. And I know you've told it thousands of times by now over your career, but for those who don't know your story, I won't say coming out of the fields of cornfields of Iowa, but can you give our mm-hmm. listeners a little bit of an overview of your story and, and where you all began? Well, I, I grew up in the Midwest. I grew up in Iowa. Um, and I always liked clothes when I was growing up. I always kind of had an affinity for it. And I think it was more or less, you know, my, both my my parents uh, grew up on farms and um, they were the first to kind of go to college from their um, family. And I never realized it until now, obviously, but the, they were very, you know, hardworking and and clothes were not the most important thing. It was definitely not the most important. And for me growing up, it was certainly very important because it's kind of how you get the girls and how you get noticed and what have you. And um, I, I just kind of fell, fell in love with that. I used to love shopping. Um, I still do. Um, and it's, it was unusual, you know, a guy, you know, who likes clothes and I also played sports and, and all that. So, um, I just, you know, kept following my dream. I kept uh, thinking about what I was going to be and, um, went to school in Iowa and went to Iowa state and studied first to be a engineer because my father was an engineer, a civil engineer. And then I moved to architecture because I thought that was more interesting and, involved drawing and I used to be a draftsman at his company. I uh, did that for half a, you know, half a semester or a semester and was like, this is boring. I don't want to do this. And I <laughs> went to business and I figured that was a safe bet. And all along, this is in 1990, like literally 90. Um, I graduated in 92. Um, I was studying finance and was working at a menswear store and called Bedowers. I used to work at two, two different stores. Bedowers, Yonkers uh, was another one, which is, um, has closed, both have closed. Um, and I used to sell clothes and I was always very intrigued. I worked in the Ralph section at Yonkers and kind of just fell in love with the world of Ralph. I didn't really know what that was other than I love the clothes and I just wanted to know more. And 
And then a friend of mine who also was working at Yonkers, Steve King, who actually works with me now, um, he worked in a different, uh, different town. And um, I'm like, aren't you in some, you know, fashion program at Iowa State? And he's like, yeah, it's called textiles and clothing. And so I quickly pivoted. I was about ready to graduate from college and I went to a um, advisor at textiles and clothing at Iowa state. And she's like, you know, you're going to have to sew. Right. And I'm like, yeah, I know that. And um, I really just wanted to do it. And I think, you know, for me again, early nineties being in the Midwest, there was definitely a, a phobia of, Oh, you're into fashion, you're gay or, mm. or whatever that is. And um, it, it probably prevented me from really following my dreams early on because there was a stigma around it and I just wasn't comfortable with it. Um, but you know, now I am so comfortable with it. It's, you know, I probably 90% of my friends are gay and, um, it's, it's like back then it was just being 20 years old and thinking, I I don't want to have that perception. Right. I didn't, I didn't really follow it. So anyway, fast forward, I, I moved to New York, I graduated. I, I was doing internships, you know, before I graduated and then I moved to New York in in 93, um, full time and started working in the industry. That's so great. Well, you know, I, I love one of the quotes that says your talent, love for fashion and determination has allowed you to create a hundred million dollar business over the years. And, and I, I've, I've loved reading some of the articles that talk about your determination and your your tenacity and your your dedication to fashion by getting these internships and really the first was with Ralph right yeah the first was with Ralph i my dad i know obviously coming from the midwest was going to be hard to break into the industry and my dad always told me if you want to be the best work for the best and i knew Ralph was was it for me i i i remember when a rep came in from Ralph Lauren and, and they were, you know, talking about the next season, they were showing us mood boards and um, the concepts, which Ralph does better than anybody. He, he really invented that whole, it's basically you walk into a room and it feels like a store and it feels like this um, like livable kind of mood. Um, it's really cool. It's almost like a movie set in a way. And um I wanted to experience that. So I had seen, you know, I, I remember I met her um, back then and I just wanted, I'm like, how do you, you know, essentially, how do you, how do I get your job? You know? <laughs> um, and just because I wanted to, to work there. So that was, that was always super, you know, big part of my goal. And I figured the best way to do it is do it through an internship. Uh, I worked for free um, and was willing to just get my foot in the door. And it really, it get, really gave me an opportunity to prove myself and um, kind of break the, you know, oh, you're from the Midwest. Cause usually everybody's either from FIT or Parsons or what have you uh, in design. Um, and I took, I took courses at FIT. I, when I did my internship with Ralph, I took a few courses at FIT um, just to, qualify for student loans and whatnot. Um, and it gave me living space, which was great. Um, it really gave me that opportunity to eat, you know, when I was at school, which was, I found interesting. Um, I went to the bookstore, of course, to get the textbooks and, um, sure enough, I'm looking through there. I'm like, wait a second. That's, that's my textbook that I use at, at Iowa state. And sure enough, my professor at Iowa State wrote those textbooks. And I was just like, wow, that's kind of impressive. And, oh, yeah. and I kept looking and there was like two or three of them. And for me, that kind of gave me a little bit of confidence. Like, wait a second, like I, my education isn't that bad. Um, and I should should believe what I'm doing. And, you know, all, all the draping and pattern making, we actually um, started at Iowa State. All the, all the textbooks were... Um, from there, which I was the professors from there wrote. So that really kind of gave me a leg up. And, um, another funny story. I remember my grandmother, cause I was, once I did the internship and I told my family, I was moving to New York, uh, and what are you going to be? I'm going to be a fashion designer. And of course they're all farmers. They're like, what, what are you going to, they pay people to do that. (laughs) Right. And they thought you were nuts. 
They thought it was nuts. They yeah. thought it was nuts. Yeah. But the best part was my grandma told me, she's like, that makes so much sense. She goes, your name Snyder in Dutch means Taylor. <laughs> and honestly, that was like a weight, like lifted off my shoulders. And it was like this, this you know, it was like meant to be. Yeah, so. this is meant to be. And it, and it is meant to be, and it was meant to be. And I love your trajectory in terms of getting that first internship um, with Ralph. But, but then obviously you went on, you know, to Gap and J. Crew and Mickey, and you've had these incredible mentors, I would say, I mean, I'm not speaking for mm. you, but, but if you want to be the best work for the best and you really have done that over the years. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I knew, um, I knew of gap, obviously I think we all did at that time. And that's, those were Mickey's like really heydays in the late eighties, early nineties. And, um, he really invented in my opinion, merchandising and, and the way, um, the way the business operates. I mean, I, I keep after him to write a book. Um, but certainly he was a mentor of mine. I didn't know Ralph personally, but I got to work there with his brother, Jerry. Um, and when I was there in, in the 90, late 90s, I was uh, back there in 98 and I got to work with uh, John Barbados. And that was a dream come true. I, I was chasing John. John Barbados um, started in the industry at Ralph and then he worked in the design uh, at Calvin Klein. And I was trying to get in there. I was, after I had done my internship, I was looking for a full-time job. And he was actually the one I interviewed with him at Calvin. And he referred me to his friend, John Kalel at J. Crew. So John was heading up J. Crew Men's in, in 92, 93. And he said, you, know, you should talk to John. I know he's looking. And sure enough, I got my foot in the door and I started working at J. Crew in 93. So incredible and and you know we all know the Ludlow story and the success of that but but how did all that experience take you to the confidence to really do what you're doing now which is launch your own brand and and what was that pivotal moment that you realized like I can do this on my own um it really was you know I my history in in fashion in New York you know I started working off at, at full-time at J crew and then I went to Gap and then I went to Ralph, um, back to Ralph in 98 to 2000. Mm. And then I went back to Gap in right after that at Old Navy. And then Mickey left there and went to J. Crew. And I was just hoping, praying that he would hire me. So he hired me in 90 or 2005, I think it was. And um, I was there through you know 2009. And... I think just my experience alone uh, was was kind of the deciding factor. I turned 40 back then. It was like 2000, 2007, I guess it was 40. Um, and I knew if I'm going to do this, I better to do it now. And um, and I had had been in J. Crew for a long time. And we opened up the liquor store. And that was a huge success. And that gave me all the confidence in the world to do it. That That really... You know, having all the years at, at J. Crew and all the years at Ralph and all the years at Gap really just, you know, Mickey is, you know, a force of nature. Like there's there's nobody like him. There no will be no one like him. Um, and I learned so much. I got, I got to work with him for almost 15 years. You know, I wasn't one on one with him. But when I was at J. Crew for the last five, um, it was one on one. I mean, I was. um he was always walking around. He was always wondering, he would always be like, what's up? What's up? That was always his favorite thing to do. And he really wanted to know what's going on. He, he was always very transparent about everything, you know, very, very good about sharing things. And I learned a lot from him, just not only from his, you know, business uh, way, but just how he would conduct himself and how he kept himself engaged. Um, not just with, the customer, but also his employees. So um, I learned a lot. And that balance, I, you know, that brings me to the launch of Todd Snyder and the balance truly of being on the creative side, but then also having to run a business. And so, you know, learning that from Mickey, learning it as you've gone along, but truly that experience of, you know, you're launching your own business. How did, talk to us a little bit about at the, those early years and, and, you know, growing the business on your own and that you know, tipping point of when 
you needed some, some help in taking it to the next level. Yeah. I mean, all the experience I had, I mean, that's really what gave me the confidence to do it, it but it also gave me the, the knowledge. I really had a, a good sense. I mean, working at Ralph, you learn, you know, visual merchandising. I mean, he yeah. was, he is the master, was the master um, forever will be the master, but he, his ability to create these scenes, you know, he really kind of thinks about it as a movie. So I got that. And then combining that with Mickey's um, business acumen was really essential. But the the one piece I probably don't talk enough about is the people I met along the way. I've, I've been really fortunate to work with some of the best people in the industry and I brought a lot of those people with me, you know, so um, Alejandro Rett, who's our head of um, merchandising and um, product, he he came with me from J. Crew, So he was the head of men's at J. Crew. So he came with me. And then, of course, you know, John Brody and John Brody's a legend in the industry, worked at Mr. Porter. He worked at J. Crew as well. Um, GQ, uh, he does all of our um, creative content. And he's incredible. Um, I just have an amazing team and they, we all, you know, we have fun doing it. It's a lot of hard work. Um, opening stores isn't easy. Um, but along the way too, you know, I, I was really fortunate to meet um, Roger Markfield and Jay Schottenstein and, and they both fell in love with my brand early on back in 2010, 2011 and started following me. And, you know, for two or three years, we were kind of going back and forth and, and Jay was like, well, what if we buy you? And, um, I'm like, oh my God, that's like a dream come true. And a dream, but also scary, right? Cause you've yeah, built this yeah. business and you're on your own, you're doing it without anyone's help. So I can only imagine that, you know, having the big guys come in and be like, what if we buy you? Yeah. I mean, at that point I was pretty, um, <laughs> I was pretty bruised and battered, I would say. <laughs> Financing your own company is difficult. I mean, I definitely had uh, another good mentor of mine, Mike Tucci, is he was an angel investor. He believed in it early on back in 2009 when I left J. Crew, because I left J. Crew 2009, the, the whole, you know, world fell apart and everybody thought I was nuts. And I, started thinking I was nuts um, and decided, you know what, I'm going to do this. And um, Mike came along and said, you know, let's, let's talk about it. And so we had this t-shirt company called tailgate clothing, which was um, college t-shirts and you know pro t-shirts and that we would sell into um, old Navy. We would sell it into even American Eagle. And that's how I started getting to know American Eagle. And so everyone was very supportive and I was, you know, very scrappy. I, I worked a lot of different gigs um, along the way. I mean, that's the one thing I don't really talk about when I was, when I was um, starting Todd Snyder, we, you know, we were making money from tailgate and pushing that into Todd Snyder. And um, my business partner at the time, Jimmy Olson, who, who he and I met each other um, at the gap and asked him, you know, you want to do this together. And he was, you know, very willing and was very key to, to making this thing happen. Um, we started, you know, selling to all these big outfitters. And then as the business started growing, um, you need more capital, you need more credit. And we didn't have it. And we started getting to a point where even though business was good, we couldn't grow much further. And so we really needed uh, a partner. And we were talking to a bunch, we were probably talking to four or five at the time. And, um, that's when, you know, AE and Jay Schottenstein and Roger came along and said, you know, what if we, what if we buy you? And it was a dream come true. So for that, it was really a godsend. It was, um, it was also daunting as you said, but, um, more so relief because the thing no one ever talks about is, how difficult it is to start a business and how, I mean, I was working three consulting gigs while I was doing Todd Snyder. I was consulting at champion Europe. I was going there for two years um, and putting all that money back into the business. I was working with target on a, a t-shirt um, collaboration I was doing with them. 
I was consult I was consulting as much as I could just to bring money into the business because it needed it. And that's kind of how you have to be, you know, when you have a brand and but and you were hustling, but the whole time you knew your North Star was Todd Snyder because I've, you know, I've heard in interviews you've done this tailgate was such a success. And it was almost like when, you know, American Eagle came in, it was gift with purchase. Todd Snyder came along <laughs> with <laughs> with tailgate. But but really your brand was your North Star during all that time when you were hustling and putting money back in. For sure. I mean, you know, it was kind of one of those things like, let's give it a go. Um and it took off right out of the gate. We we got into Neiman's and Bergdorf's immediately. We were exclusive there. Um, and then we just kept having great success. And then all of a sudden, the Japanese loved our brand. And we partnered with a company there. And we opened up uh, about five stores there back in 2012, um, which were great. And it kind of, again, kind of helped me fine tune what I was thinking is, you know, aesthetically for both the retail and the brand. Um, and just always learning. I just was yeah. always continuing to understand what sells, understand, um, what made sense. And along the way we would start to build these, um, key item styles that became, you know, famous for us, you know, you know, the Dylan suede, uh, trucker jacket. That's one of our best selling styles. It's made in Italy. It's about a thousand dollars, great quality, but it's like the one thing I think guys kind of look at a leather jacket as their sports car in a way, yeah. um, in a good way. Sure. Don't, don't think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just thinking about my own husband. I'm like, I'd much rather get a couple leather jackets instead of a couple sports cars. He's going to be racing around, but, but it, that's true. And, and during this time, Todd, because I, I, you're obviously you're so familiar with the business. You've learned so much, the growth here. Um, talk to me about DTC because that has been part of the evolution of the Todd Snyder brand and how you were wholesaling and then you pulled back. What was that time frame that you started to make those decisions? It really happened early on. It, it happened. We started wholesale, started off only wholesale. Uh, and then about six months later, we launched our own website and that was the first, like, oh my gosh, like how much did we sell? And, you know, we were, we, we were maybe first year out, maybe half a million dollars in okay. sale, which, you know, wasn't bad. We were in the best stores. It kind of right. was teed up perfectly. And then we had a website that was doing two, 300,000. And I'm like, wait, are you kidding? And it was just, and it kept growing. And then that was what, really gave me the idea of, I need to pivot away from wholesale. I, I always like this, the wholesale, there, there's definitely some great partners out there, but the wholesale at that time was really broken. Uh, most of, most retailers, big retailers that you're talking to, and I won't main, mention names, they all want guarantees. They all want to make sure that they're investment is protected and you're going to protect it no matter if they buy a thousand of one style and it doesn't sell or they buy 10, you know, pieces of a style, they, they really want to make sure that they are protected. And for a young brand that doesn't have any, you know, we're not an LVMH, you know, LVMH right. comes in and says, you're going to buy this and you're going to buy this much and X, Y, and Z, but I didn't have that kind of backing. So we were learning all that on our own and it's really hard also to make a name for yourself inside of a bigger retailer, because, you know, typically you're one of many. And if you don't get shown right, if the sales team doesn't know who you are, um, I remember I used to go on these sales trips and I go to, I was in Dallas and a Neiman store and, and I coming, I'm coming in for a seminar to talk about my brand. And the guys were like, Oh, what, what are you here for? I said, I'm, I'm Todd Snyder. It's like, what do you do? I'm like, that's my brand over there. Yeah. I'm going to tell you what I do. Um, and, um, but yeah, no one knew who I was. So it, it just took a long time for all of that to, to build. And I didn't have time, meaning like I knew that direct to consumer was going to be the gateway. I knew that that was going to be ultimate, but in the meantime, you need the retailers to help you with minimums because you can't afford to buy, you know, 500 units of a style. You 
really only needed like 50 at the time. So there's always a balance of that. And, and I learned quickly that I knew if I was going to be super successful, I needed to be direct consumer. And, and if I didn't have American Eagle, I don't, I don't think this, this brand would be here that, that we were definitely at a point and this was 2000, they bought us in 2015, if I remember correctly. And, um, you know, another thing I don't talk about, but I was, we were looking to shop it or unload it or what have you in that time frame. And I was talking to Nike at the time and I had a job offer to be the head of product there, um, which I love Nike and I would have loved to do that job, but I was simply trying to, you know, find a means to an end. I was actually trying to get Nike to buy tailgate and uh, that didn't work either. So that would have been good. Um, yeah. That is amazing. But then, but, but so during this time, you have this knowledge of direct to consumer and listen, you do it so well through your in-store experience. And when you were talking about Mickey, it made me think about how you have taken so much of that influence that Mickey had on you. And that's what you're pouring into your stores. I go into your stores. I love your stores. I can feel your brand. Yeah. It's, it is, um, it's very recognizably Todd Snyder and your website's the same and your social media. So there's that consistency. And as you're talking about, you know, walking into some of these big box retailers, the wholesalers, you're not able to tell that, have that same storytelling. So how do you balance that through your website, through your social media? Cause I, and, and obviously in store experience, cause I think you really do such a good job of that. Thank you. That's, that means a lot. It's, it's definitely the thing I, I take most pride in is, I really look at the whole ecosystem, you know, everything from, you know, store to me, they're all touch points for a customer. Yeah. How does a customer discover you? How do they re-engage with you? How do they, how do they feel? And the one thing about the stores that I, I go back to my days at Bedowers and I just remember working there and, and we always had to know all of our customers by, you know, Mr. Jones, Mr. Mm. What, and, until they told you, you know, call me Jim. Right. That's how small a town it was, by the way, just for our listeners, because it's <laughs> the town you were in was how many people to be able to know people by name and the fact they were coming into the store that often. Yeah, I mean, it was it was Des Moines, Iowa, and I, I don't know how big it was or how small it was, but it was it was not big. I mean, yeah. we, you know, it's not it wasn't it was on a street, so you didn't have a lot of it wasn't like a mall. So but I just remember that. And I remember the first time that I came to New York City and I remember going into retail stores and I just felt like I was always going to get kicked out. I always, and I still feel that today. Like you can go why? into stores and you feel like, like, why is this? Like, this makes no sense. I'm going to spend money. You're supposed to take, I'm going to take, I mean, it's like yeah. the whole thing is backwards and I'm like, okay, this makes no sense. So my goal, and that always stuck with me. And when I was thinking about retail is I really wanted to create this sense of inclusiveness and, you know, making it feel like you're welcome and making it feel, you know, Hey, what brings you in today? And, and then you get to know people. And, and I always tell the sales team this, the, the, you're better off. And I know this sounds weird, but trying to sell usually means you won't sell that much. If you're good at just getting to get people to bring their guards down and get them to kind of talk about what brings them in, what are they doing? It, it all of a sudden makes the good person feel comfortable and at ease. And, you know, if you have the right sales team and you have the right um, talent on making people feel comfortable in, in your store, you win. Cause then they feel like, oh, I can trust this person. They're not just trying to sell me something. Um, and I, one of my favorite stories I love telling is I was down at the liquor store. I was, I was doing something down there. This down in Tribeca, I have a small store inside of an old liquor. It's actually a bar. Um, but we've turned it into retail and I was down there doing something. And this couple came in they're from Nashville and they're like, Oh my God, you're Todd Snyder. Can we take a photo with you? And I'm like, Oh, what brings you to town? And well, we're here for our anniversary I'm like, that's amazing. And you came to our store. That's incredible. And um, I started you know, like, well, where are you guys going to go to dinner tonight? Any place fun? They told me where they're going. And I was like, you know, I said, if you're into it, I said, let me know. There's this amazing restaurant. It's across the street. It's a Michelin star restaurant called One White Street. If you want to go there, 
let me know. I can get you a table. So, and, and sure enough, I call the chef, chef Austin. Um, and I'm like, he's literally outside as well. I bring him across. I said, you know, you know, meet these people they're in for their anniversary. Could they dine with you tonight? Um, and he looks on his phone, finds it. He's like, yeah, you're all set for eight o'clock. And they were just, oh my gosh. And they, we took a photo and everything. And I just, you know, for me, obviously it's, it's that kind of connection that you make. Um, but even like our sales staff I and mean, they're yeah. so good at just making, and the whole point of bringing people in is just making them feel part of the neighborhood, part of the community, um, and comfortable. But how do you do that, Todd, with not only the 17 stores, we're going to talk about the growth of the, and the opening of the additional stores you have coming down the line, but, but online, right? You're DTC. So you're, you're talking to these customers. You're able to make reservations for them in person. By the way, to our listeners, Todd Center is not going to make reservations for all of your anniversaries. <laughs> so that was a one-off. I'm going to save him that time. Yeah. But, um, but online, what's your success been? I mean, online was really, you know, more about, we also do a catalog, um, you know, so thinking about all the different points of, you know, we call them channels, all the different channels that we sell in, whether it's in store or online through catalog, um, you know, a lot of this is also word of mouth, you know, the more, you know, if you th think about restaurants that you love or, yeah. you know, books you love, typically you hear, hear about them through friends, you know, and, um, it's very hard to kind of navigate that. And, and the parallel is very similar. I mean, I think especially today, but I realized early on, as I started seeing our, our online business, uh, doing so well that I needed to really study that, that sector. And at the time it was, you know, DTC was a new word. Um, and, um, disruptors was a new thing that was happening. This is all in 2010 timeframe, but you had everybody from Warby Parker to Bonobos to what have you. And I was watching what Bonobos was doing and I'm like, I can do that better. Like I need, but I need to understand I can make a better product yeah. for sure. I can make a better store environment. And, but they knew something I didn't, they knew how to market themselves digitally. And that's where I invested all my, my, you know, energy and new hires and just understanding the whole um, digital marketing uh, platform and how, in, how you're getting a new customer. So studied that a lot, hired some great people and just really focused all of our efforts on how do you acquire customers and how do you get people to discover who you are? And that's really what helped us grow quickly. I mean, we grew, um, I think we were, when American Eagle bought us, we were doing 2 million a year. Um, and then I remember on our first store, we opened uh, the Madison store about eight years ago. And that, that store was our only store for a long time. And then I think 19 ish, we, we picked up the liquor store cause J crew moved out and I was like, I'll take that. Um, and then we opened up East Hampton and, um, and really, you know, Jay was such is talking about another amazing mentor, you know, someone who obviously is very good at business. He's an entrepreneur at spirit, you know, by you know, within his, his bones, like he grew up in the industry. And I remember during the pandemic and we're all kind of hunkering down, we're all like trying to plan out, like, how are we going to get through this? What's the state of retail? Our store was closed for eight months and, and everybody, you know, it was tough. And it, within those eight months, I remember Jay saying, you know, I really want you to open, I want you to go and open 10 stores. And I'm like, you're like, you're what? insane. <laughs> and he said, you have to make K when the sun is shining and being from Iowa, of course I knew what that meant. Yeah, and, yeah. and, and most people don't know what that means. And my wife who's from Philly, she's like, what does that mean? And I said, well, you don't make hay when it's wet because then the hay gets moldy and um, it, it, then it's unusable. So I knew what that meant. And so we started looking for stores and that was the best advice, um, you know, at the time. And it was just incredible. And so we quickly opened two or three stores and then we were getting some just really amazing spaces. You know, our, our first big one was rock center, which I'm so proud of. And, Jen Alliance came to me during the pandemic and it's like, do you want to open up a store in, in rock center? And I was kind of like, 
no. <laughs> like, <laughs> and and this was like, this was four years ago and this was right around the pandemic time. And I'm like, that doesn't make sense. Cause you just thought big crowds don't right, want to do that. Right. And, um, and then she told me what she was doing up there. You know, she was bringing in Frenchette. It was another amazing restaurant yeah, that opened yeah. up La Rock and you know, just all the amazing restaurants that are up there. And I'm like, I'm in. So. And that was number what in terms of stores at that point? I think that was number three. I think that was number three. So I think number, number one was the Madison store on, on Madison park. Um, and then we opened liquor store. And then we opened East Hampton. Um, and then it was Rock. Rock was four. And so. you're now at, because I'm trying to get the number straight, are you at 17 with three opening? Or are you at 20 with five more opening? What, where are we? We are at 19 now. 19. And I think we have a, yeah, I think we're 19. And I think we have another four planned um, for 25. And but. across the country, I know you're in LA. I know you've got some incredible locations. So talking about awareness and growth here, but you really are, you're across the country, but are there markets that you feel like you're, you're focusing on for the next 12, 18, 24 months? Um, we're definitely always looking. I mean, having 23 stores is, is a lot. I mean, we're in, we're in all of our top markets. Um, so number one is New York. Number two is LA. Number three is San Francisco and then Chicago, Boston, and then everybody else. Um, New York by far is our best, you know, we've got a store in Williamsburg, uh, Brooklyn. We've got, you know, now we have three stores in Manhattan. Um, we have East Hampton, we have Manhasset. Um, we also have Greenwich and, um, that's, I think that's it for the East coast, but yeah, I mean, we're always looking. I, 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 I never thought I would open 20 stores to be honest with you. I thought 20 would be enough. Um, but we don't sell wholesale. So it's a right. different, it's a different beast, but and I would say we don't sell wholesale. It's not to say that we won't, you know, open wholesale. It's just really, it's a whole different enterprise. It really needs its own infrastructure and people. And right now we have so much work just trying to open these stores, um, get them, you know, get the right people, get yeah. the right teams, get the assortments, right? Like that's a really hard puzzle. Cause you're, we have a store. We, we've been really fortunate. I mean, we've built the brand in a great way. Um, you know, we get a lot of landlords coming at us, um, asking us to be in their centers, which yep. is a it's huge a compliment. Yeah. You know, we're at, we're in Bell Harbor which is super hard to get into. Um, we're at the Grove, which is impossible to get into. Um, and then we have some really special smaller stores, you know, throughout the country, yeah. um, which I'm, you know, I think all the stores, you know, we try to think about where our customer is and, and we try to open up in markets that have, you know, the ability to maybe have two or three stores. Yeah. Um, because, you know, it is, it's hard to find great people, but it's really yeah. hard to find, you know, a general manager that can, you know, you don't want to overpay them for one store. You kind of right. need them to leverage two or three stores. So Ironic. like LA, yeah. LA is a good example of that. We have the Grove, which is a big giant store, long hours. And then we have a store on Abbot Kenny uh, in Venice Beach. Um, that's like a boutique, super small jewel box store. We call it the bungalow um, because it is a bungalow that we turned into a store. Um, And then, you know, we're looking for a a third there that we can um, do something closer in Belbury Hills, uh, West Hollywood area. But I I go to all the stores. I mean, I I go to all the locations and, you know, we pick them together. We all, I've been, like I said, American Eagle has been great in so many ways where I get to leverage their real estate team, their legal team. There's just so much. Their finance team, yeah. um, their their alloc- or allocations team, and even their their kind of distribution team as well. So it's really I couldn't do that without you know without having them. It's just 19, 20 stores, even four stores is a lot. Yeah, but. yeah. Well, they've certainly given you the platform with all the infrastructure, as you've talked about, but also the ability to, I would think, and I'm not going to take you down a path you don't want to go, but eventually, you know, on a global level, um, 
I love that you showed at Pitti Womo in front of 800 people and your brand has <laughs> exploded that way. I mean, that's, that is incredible. And I want to talk about that because, you know, you've said, you know, you're, you are DTC. And so wholesale is on sort of hold for now as you focus on these new stores. But tell me a little bit about that experience and how that has probably reinvigorated your idea of coming back to New York Fashion Week because we've got, what, two weeks from today? I know when we air this, it'll probably be right at the time of your show, but what an exciting time. (laughs) Stressful. Yeah, exactly. We'll wrap things up so you can go back to planning. But that's an amazing thing to to come back to New York. It's what, been four years since you showed? Yeah, it's been four years. And we we showed um, February of 2020, right before the pandemic. And talk about time. It was, yeah, it was crazy. I mean, I, I, I just had a kid and we had a show and then we all locked locked in ourselves in the homes. Um, but it was, um, you know, it, I kind of got a little bit, you know, obviously the pandemic happened. Business was, was good. Like everybody, I think everybody had good business. Uh, the first couple of years, I mean, the first six months sucked, but the, the rest was okay. I didn't have a lot of stores at the time, which was a blessing. Um, had one, I had two actually, I had two at the time of that. Um, but I didn't have a lot of stores. And so that, that was a blessing. Um, but also having the backing of American Eagle, I never, I wouldn't survive that. That would have been, that would have put me out of business. Um, but I, I kind of got complacent a little bit. I, I, business was good. We were, our stores were doing great when we reopened and we hadn't done a show. And I'm like, do we really need to do a show? Our business is like, you know, you know, 50, 50 comping, you know, year over year. It's unbelievable. And, you know, and then I kind of just kept talking myself out of it every season because it was so expensive and it's a lot, it's a lot of work. I have to put myself in a really, um, tough, I I sometimes say dark place because I think any artist goes through this. I mean, my mom was an artist and, you know, I, I don't think I had the guts to be an artist just because you're always, you know, you're basically making a living off of what you're selling. And it's a really hard twisted because you, you beat yourself up you're like should I do this this is what the customer wants so I know I have to you know do what I think so anyway there's this whole thing that you kind of open and this it's self-reflection and it's always and so I hadn't done it for a while and then Pitti Omo invited us to do the show and I had to jump on that because it was, it was a dream of mine right. most of my most of my fabric comes from Italy I'm yeah. in Italy all the time and it's a huge honor like Pitti Omo is like huge honor I I remember I used to, we used to go there for wholesale. I used to go there and sell, try to sell champion and stuff and, and my product. And it was really hard. And I was like, God, this just sucks. I wish there was a way we could do a show. And getting that invite was like, kind of like a leapfrog in a lot of ways of not having to, you know, necessarily do it have on a booth your own. And, yeah. 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 So that was incredible. And for me, it was very much a self-reflection. It was like going back to everything I loved. Um, I used to make my own shirts on the weekends and I used to be able to make my own suits and uh, I'd make a lot of my own clothes because I like experimenting with different fabrics and things I didn't see in the market. And I love that. And, but I forgot about what that was because I was so always working somewhere and I didn't have time to do that. And doing this show we had, as you said, we had 800 people. We probably could have had double the amount. Um, and we had 80 models. Um, it was incredible. It was a dream come true for me. And I always dreamt of, you know, Armani for me back in the day yeah. was, it was Armani and Ralph and Armani, um, you know, just, I just always remember those amazing shows he would do in Milan and, and gosh, I felt like, you know, here I am at what an honor. beginning of, fashion week and here's a kid from Iowa, let alone America. <laughs> it's such an incredible honor. And I love that that is what sort of spurred you back into the New York fashion week. And, and again, knowing you have the show coming up and, and I love, you know, reading how for you, it really is going back to what we first started talking about at the start of the, our conversation about storytelling and how you have mm-hmm. that opportunity to connect with 
the media, the editors, and and tell the story because I think your your technique and your attention to detail and and that is important to be able to express that. So um, I'm sure it's it's a lot to to get back into these shows, but um, but I'm I'm excited for you, and I know it's it's a big fall ahead. Um, and I also love the connection of of the show being at Rockefeller Center at at La Rock. Am I correct in saying yeah. that? Yeah. 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 Um, so that is also, as you said, sort of a, a, a pivotal place for you with that store and, and with the connections to the restaurant owner, who I know is also an owner of a restaurant downtown. I've done my research, Todd, on you, wow. <laughs> but, wow. the, but these connections um, and the relationships you have. And, and I know that, again, you've got so much on your plate. I don't want to take more of your time, but I, I have to ask because, um, again, the future for Todd Snyder, I, I would love to hear from you, you know, what does the future look like for you um, in terms of, of goals that you have for the brand? Um, we've talked a little bit about where stores are, are opening, but what's, what does the future look like for Todd Snyder? Well, um, it's ever evolving. And like I said, I never thought I'd open 20 stores. Right. Um, Jay thinks I should open 40 stores. Um, and I think he said in a, in a, in a recent earnings call that, you know, you know, Todd Snyder will be a half a billion dollar brand and all that. Um, he's a lot smarter than me. So I, uh, <laughs> I won't say no. Um, I hope we get there someday, but I do think, you know, certainly, you know, the store expansion will be something we continue to study and and continue to, we're still small. We're still scrappy. We're still, still trying to figure it out. Like we don't have all the answers and it's hard when you're, a small brand and you have a young team that are all, you know, trying to do the best they can, but trying to assort 20 stores is really hard, especially when they're in one's in Miami and it's never cold and one's right. in California and you never know. And it's like, um, it's challenging. And, you know, we've talked to a lot of people about wholesale. Um, wholesale is definitely something we will. It's, it's just really more a matter of when um, we will, uh, re-engage with. And, um, I would say international is, is probably next on that list, but that's, it's much further down the road just because it's, it's a whole nother enterprise and it's a lot more challenging. So, but it is definitely something that we see. Um, and then just kind of a continuation of, of everything we've been doing everything, you know, we've, we've added our own footwear to the collection. It's all made in Italy. And it's doing very well. And, and my merchants keep after me, like, can we do socks? Can we do socks? And the ever and growing world, they're just going to keep throwing it at you. Yeah. I mean, it's the more we can do, you know, it just it, at the end of the day, the reason why, you know, I started the brand was I really wanted to have a brand that was accessible. Um, and we call it affordable luxury. Yep. And I think it's really important, especially today. I've gone into a lot of stores recently and it's crazy what the price points are. Like I'm shocked at how expensive a sweater is from some brands. Um, and it doesn't need to be that way. And we, we make a lot of our product in Italy. We make, we make all over the globe. You know, we use Italian fabrics. We use Japanese fabrics. We make in Italy, Portugal, the U S Canada, Mauritius, and that's going to continue because I think it's important because we um, there's some made in Asia as well, Vietnam. Um, it's important to have the balance and it's important to have the balance, not just from a resource perspective, but more from a pricing because I don't want everything to be, you know, thousands of dollars. Um, I want things that a guy can come in um, and feel like he's getting a good value. And, and I've always looked at apparel and I hope my customers do is it's an investment, you know, especially in menswear and certainly in women's wear too, but more so in menswear is because fashion doesn't change as, as fast and you can make investments, you know, in, in a, you know, $800 pair of shoes for men's that you'll have for 10 years. Um, and they never go out of style or, you know, a suit or a tuxedo that you can have for multiple, um, seasons and, and that for me has always been important to be accessible, but also 
having things that endure time is important. Um, so as we grow, I've always wanted to be that one-stop shop for the guy that can come in and not feel like he's got to go to five different stores. So, so anyway, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's, it does. And listen, I feel like you are such a wealth of knowledge and I could spend another hour talking to you because there's so much we haven't even touched upon, but for our listeners, because I think this is your, again, story is, is so interesting and um, so inspiring. And what I would love to know is for those getting into the fashion and retail industry, what advice would you give? What's, what's your one, your biggest takeaway, biggest advice for those who, who want to get into the industry? Um, I would say same thing my dad said, you know, if you want to be the best work for the best and there are no shortcuts. I mean, you'll get lucky occasionally. I didn't start my brand until I was 20 years into the industry. And it was because of all those connections of the people I knew and the doors that opened because I had all those connections is the real reason why I'm still here today. And a lot of people want to be like, I have a dream of doing this. And then they start their business too early and they run out of money and no one knows who they are. And then they go away. And it's really, and why not? I mean, I, I worked in the industry for 20 years. I worked for some of the best brands. Um, and you know, I got to travel the world. They were flying me to Singapore, to Hong Kong to, and on business class and putting us in the best hotels. And then, Oh, we need you to go over to London to do X, Y. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> yeah, let's I'll do go. that. Yeah. Sign, sign me, sign me up. So you know, it, it didn't hurt to put in the time. And yeah. I remember when I was in my twenties, I was like, gosh, this is taking so long. It's taking so long. And then the thirties came along and then I got the job at J crew um, when I was 35, head of men's. And, and then I knew it was my time. I knew, okay, 40 sounds like a good time. And I probably could have started a little bit earlier, but I definitely needed the confidence of what the liquor store gave me. Um, when we opened that store, it was just, kind of set everything uh, very clear for me. You knew you could do it. Well, going back to the having the talent, the love for fashion and the determination is truly what has made you who you are and and the success of the brand. So huge congratulations. This has been such a treat to spend time with you. And, and again, I know you've got a lot going on, so we're grateful for your time um, and just best of My luck pleasure. for the show and, and for our listeners, you know, follow Todd on social media and his go into his stores and online and um, we'll all be thrilled to watch this success of the brand and the continued evolution of it. So Thank you, Todd. Thank you. I appreciate that. If you want to learn a little bit more about Traub, you can go to traub.io, where you'll learn a lot about everything that we do. If you're enjoying the safari, please do share it with your friends and colleagues within the industry. And please also don't forget to subscribe and like it. Until next time.